Dum dum dum. And I hope it works. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> does it work? It does, yeah. Oh, great. So maybe I will do some first, we'll, we'll start with some first question and afterwards I hope that um, people are asking, always welcome to ask. Um, so yeah, um, to Angie and Simon, um, how was the idea for the film born and what motivated you to produce it and why Nepal? Amzi. Shall I start? Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> so the motivation for Nepal, uh, who it, uh, it started a few years, like one year before we went to Nepal. Um, like my parents, they live on a mountain hut, and there we had a um, a friend. He was from Nepal, and he told me many stories about the country, and so this was like pretty sure that I want to see it. And um, when I started movie school in Munich, um, I met Simon. And we, yeah, we we thought of of going to Nepal and um, produce the movie. Basically, we didn't know how to start. <laughs> it was a really running gun action. Um, yeah, but long story short, we we sat on the plane. And on the way to Nepal, ready to, to film, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, nothing, nothing to add there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was pretty lucky because Simon was really spontaneous um, for the idea as well. So what I, what I said, we met in the movie school. But Simon, I think you finished one year earlier than me. Um, um, yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. Yeah, um, I guess I was a little bit more experienced in the craft of, of filming and, and stuff, but at the same time, it, it I don't know, it was a super good match because when we met, she, Angie was more of the production talent and, and constructing uh, that this film even happened because I'm I'm all, all over the place and I'm, I'm I was just concentrated on on doing some filming and uh, I think that was the good mix where we said like yeah this could this could happen even in a team of two because we have all the skill sets we need for this film and um, I guess that was yeah the start of everything exactly mm. Does anybody ha else have a question about the uh, starting process of the film? Yes, me. <laughs> and so you <laughs> just had the idea of the location, but not um, on which topic you are going to make the movie about? <laughs> um, <laughs> so the topic, yeah. As I said, we, we didn't have really a huge plan to start. What Maybe the plan was is it possible to produce a documentary without any big concept? And I remember when we, yeah, so we did some preparation, like reading about the country and about the history. Um, there was also the time when the earthquake happened just a few months before we started our trip there. Um, it was more about, yeah, to do a, it, are we able to produce a well movie without any concept, any big preparations? Because we didn't know anyone over there. We, I mean, I knew one, one older schoolmate. He was from Nepal. Um, but it turned out that um, only like three weeks after we arrived in Nepal that he started helping us. And the whole idea of the five people, it... It basically developed during the stay itself, right, Simon? <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, totally. Because in terms of preparation, it was we we even tried to 
to do a lot of preparation. Andre and me, we I think we rented a, a flat for almost, or we, or we got a rent for two weeks or one week. I don't remember exactly how much time was it. I think Before, two weeks. Yeah, you, when we when we had the flat where we um, where we thought of the name, for example, where we started to do the concepts and at least try it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we had we had we had this time before where we um where we tried to figure out what the film is going to be about but we noticed pretty pretty fast that the whole concept is going to evolve in the process so that was and and that was fine for us because we knew we can pull it off but we just didn't know the full story yet basically and yeah, and then all the people like Savos, like Chering, came by and helped us develop, like getting to the people and and seeing what we would want to do. Yeah, but the plan was not really there in the beginning, <laughs> to be honest. Like it, it was very hard because we were two two students, you know, and uh, we. No, it was more like uh, Nepali style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was actually pretty <laughs> Nepali, so yeah, yeah. We tried to adapt. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's why it was reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello. Um, so how did you get to know the first protagonist, the monk? Mm. The, the first protagonist, um, we, was it? From Charing. Yeah, it was um, from Charing. It was really the first protagonist we filmed as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, because it was like, I think we were two and a half weeks in Nepal with nothing really um, happening. We were trying to, to, to get used to the to the country, to the people. I think Simon, it was your first time in Asia as well. Yeah. So, and even for Nepal, it, it's, it's such a beautiful city, but so much diverse and so different than our culture. But the first, um, like the monk, we got to know from chairing as well, it's true. And it turned out to be the perfect the perfect um, protagonist for this first chapter. And it was really fun because when Jering told us about um, uh, about the monastery, which was pretty close by to um, to Pokhara, I remember, yeah. Um, <clears throat> then uh, we just we just went to the monastery and asked asked around, basically, like, is there any possibility to to film here? And um, yeah, we, we were really lucky that we got him for, and he was, he was super easy with everything. He said like, yeah, just, just come with me and I, it's no problem at all. And we were, it was fascinating how calm he was and, and uh, the whole experience with him. It was really nice, good energy there. Especially we were allowed to film in the monastery, like I think for the yeah. morning meditations and morning chakras. And I remember Simon crawling around the, the monks when they were singing and doing their mantras. It was, it was pretty interesting to watch as well. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of vibration there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really hard if, you, if you're in, a, in, in such a place where a lot of culture is happening and, and a lot of yeah, calmness is, is, as well. And then you're entering with a video camera and trying to capture the moment, but you are yourself not really attached to the situation because you, you have to maintain professional in a way. And, but you want to be in the situation as well. So I guess what I'm just saying that I creeped around there <laughs> might have been uh, <laughs> looking weird because um, yeah I tried to capture the moment but I, I guess I was not with them in there so it was it was very interesting it's always a, a thin line when you film these these special moments yeah, yeah. but it was it was during the whole whole three months 
It was always yeah. a thin line to not cross, uh, I, to not cross something. Did, did I cross it sometimes? Did you have the feeling that, or did we cross it at some point? We, we just had one big breakdown. That's what I remember. No. Okay, well, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> one big. <laughs> what do you mean when you say, um, what you just said? <laughs> that, uh, oh, it's a long story. <laughs> um, can you um, repeat the question? Yes. Okay. Um, you just said that you think you did not cross the line, right? Uh, what line do you mean? Uh, you, you know the like cultural line, like Simon and Mia, we're from Western culture, and in Nepal, the people, the culture is, it's much more like the Buddhist side or the Hindu side. It's a lot of more religious, and even we we didn't know so much. It was also new for us, so we. We, ne we never really know, is it all right what we are doing? Especially Simon did most, like a lot of, most of the filming. And it was like when you film a person, because Homebird is mostly about the humans in Nepal, like the people, um, you stand like maybe half a meter in front of their faces with the lens in their face. So that's when you never know when you cross the line, you try to show respect, but as well, you want to show real emotions. And there was like this walking on the line. Yeah. I remember a discussion we had where there were this woman who were... Can you just mute yourself, please. There was this woman, she was... Uh, I have to... <laughs> Still some echoing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, like there was the earthquake a few months before, and then there were all these women who were mourning in in, in Bhaktapur, and they were running around crying, which was part of their death ritual. So I actually rem just remember this discussion with Bungie and Simon saying, "Can we film this? Like, can we just catch their emotions? People running on the street who are like mourning for their husbands or their fathers or their brothers who died in the earthquake." And this was like, I remember this discussion on like, can we do this now or not? Is this like appropriate or is this like crossing this threshold where you really enter into someone's privacy, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, how did you handle it then? Um, I, I, we, we filmed it. Uh, but the thing is like now, Inge is like that Inge now you told me this. Inge was, it was the, mo the biggest luck that we met Inge because Inge is from Austria as well. So we didn't know before. It was coincidence we met actually and Inge told us she was actually our guide she she turned out to be our our cultural and local guide for a lot of important things so I didn't know if it would turn out the way it is now if without Inge and Zarosh. <laughs> of course yeah yeah I, I, I saw Rada is on that Oh no, she's gone again. Yeah. Oh. She was shortly online. How did you get to know Inge? By walking inside the facilities. <laughs> um, no, we, we got a hint from, I mean, we had this big connection, uh, Charing. It would be lovely if Charing was here as well because he's also a big part of the film. Um, and he, he put us to all the different people. He was, he was, he was the connecting dot probably uh, in all of this. And yeah, then he said like, yeah, there's Inge and Saros who might help us um, with, with uh, some of the filming, with uh, locations, with whatever. And so we, we went inside the, uh, um, how's, how's the facility exactly called again? Because if I say it wrong, it's, it's <laughs> Inge, you and Savas, it's your turn. VHS back to poor. VHS, yeah, okay, yeah, in back to poor. Where the, and then we just continued from there. And uh, the two of them also traveled with us um, a certain amount of time. And yeah, we're just a big help in, in regards of knowing how to behave in the country, probably. Um, knowing where to film, what to do, and yeah. Everyone along the way pretty much helped us um, getting 
deeper into into Nepal probably because we wouldn't have done it without it. We were just two students eager to f to film something, and then everyone came along and like, yeah, we get this connection. We have this one and this one, and then we went along with the journey. And also through Inge, we got to know Rada. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, Rada. I can see. <laughs> Hi, Rada. Can you can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. Ah, great. Hey, yeah. Anna. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Just on time for your own chapter. <laughs> so nice that you managed to join again. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you all. Hello. Can so, I speak too. something about the documentary? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, it is a very moving story, actually. It was the year of the earthquake, right? And when I was in the most affected uh, district, Sindhu Palchok on the fourth day of the earthquake, um, I saw everywhere dead bodies. There was a bad smell from the house uh, due to the death of the animals. And I was so touched with the scenario and then I promised myself I could not celebrate the Dasai big festival this year. I wanted to commemorate the all people who were dying in, during the earthquake. But I did not know how and um, where. Fortunately, uh, about two months later, uh, Inge asked me, um, are you interested for uh, making a documentary about your work and women status in Nepal? And I said, yes. And But the time was so limited and we had to work during the Dasan festival. And I said, Okay, I want to avoid the Dasi festival. This, this was my promise. I wanted to dedicate it, my Dasi for the people who were losing their family members during the earthquake. This is how we decided and we all went to the um, Jumla. But th that was the time of the border blockade. We did not have um, uh, uh, fuels, gas, and uh, it was so tough to reach out uh, a Jumla by car from Kathmandu to Jumla. It took three days and we run, we run out with the fuel and then it was a very adventurous, very painful story. I think India can explain more nicely. It was a bumpy ride. <laughs> yes, I think um, yeah. I stop right now here yeah, and I will come back again. Is that okay? If you have Thank any you, questions, let, let me know. <laughs> yeah, does anybody has a question? Because we are also in the part where it's what the focus was on Rada, maybe in the scenes of the film, concerning the scenes. <laughs> Is Rada out now? Um, no, I don't. Rada, are you still? Yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Don't you see me? Don't you see me? No, no, we see you, but you were very still, so we thought it's a freeze frame. <laughs> so maybe I have then a question to you, Rada. Um, Please, because uh, your your parents were mentioned in the film and that they have quite an impact on you and your life. And um, what are the impacts that they had on you, your mother and your father? I do not hear properly. Uh, it is a crack, crack oh. but I, I will try my best. Actually, in picture, the, uh, my mother passed away about uh, that time, uh, seven years back. You only can see when I was holding the uh, photo of my mom. Actually, I was recalling the statement of my mom. And I was with my dad, uh, who is wearing the um, white shorts, just uh, uh, for a while uh, um, ago. 
and uh, my father went to Joomla in 1960s. And I was so impressed with him because he kept telling the stories from Joomla. And when I grown up, I, I, I promised uh, and I went to there during the peak uh, timing of Maoist insurgency in Nepal. That time there was no any... Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Life as an edit best. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is this is in my computer. Wait, uh, <laughs> because uh, I use it, it. Very sorry because uh, my mobile and uh, laptop both uh, ringing while someone calling in Facebook. I don't know why. <laughs> when I went to the Joomla, it was the uh, peak time of the Maoist insurgency in Nepal. Uh, there was no telephone, no electricity, no uh, motorable road that time. And the, especially girls and women were um, suffered so much uh, from the menstrual restriction. It is called Chaupadi over there. And then the other kind of gender-based violence, including um, high maternal mortality rate. That time the maternal mortality rate uh, in Joomla was 10 times higher than the national figure. And uh, I saw the woman uh, was dying in front of me because of the bleeding after the childbirth. That was the very um, uh, heart-wrenching moment, moment for me. But uh, in the meantime, I also determined to to do something so uh, in consultation with the government people uh, army personnel police and other civilians uh, even during the maoist insurgency time uh, we able to start the she section um, over there that was the first time in the history of that region mm -hmm. and we also started the blood bank that pictures were seen in the uh, movie Even today, the, there are so many things keep changing, especially in the headquarters of the uh, Joomla, the infrastructure has already changed. The electricity, in, uh, uh, the telephone, even the, that hospital become the medical college right now, that kind of things has dramatically changed. But in terms of the um, life of girls and women, there is no significant change. Even today, um, the um, um, women in Joomla are working about 18 hours in a day. Um, uh, they also subject to uh, subject with uh, uh, subject to with the varieties of abuses, exploitation, violences uh, at uh, home, in school, and everywhere. Um, it's, it's not much changing. And uh, in terms of the education, the uh, education is still uh, very. Um, uh, not accessible for the girls. The boys uh, are started to go to the private school. They have privileges, but uh, girls, they enroll in the schools, public school, but uh, uh, they cannot go when there is a work at the uh, house. And also, um, if they continue the school, if they can go to the school, they, there is no uh, adequate infrastructure for the quality education, like uh, building, the teacher, the other audiovisual learning materials. There are so many things still um, uh, not uh, available in the public school. So long way to go. Ada, I, I, I have a question for Ada. Please. Yes, or for not only Ada because uh, for Savos as well, for for Inge because you're in in Nepal. Um, can you type over here because it is not um, the internet is really slow and I I do not hear properly. Can you type, uh, Simon? Ah, should I type it? Yeah, sure. Okay, wait. Uh, one moment. Okay, I, I typed it in the chat. So basically the question was, 
um, Do you have it, the feeling this movie changed anything in Nepal? Ah, uh, yes, of course. Uh, um, though this uh, this movie is not much accessible to the people who are uh, directly relevant uh, from Jumla and other parts of the country, only the people mm -hmm. who have a very good internet access. Uh, who, who can use the Vimeo because this movie is, is in uh, Vimeo, Vimeo mode. That is why very few people see it. But in uh, outside of the country, many people access this movie and they reach out with me and they asked um, uh, what are the changes has already taken place or not and why these changes are taking place. What should we do? So it gives a kind of um, kind of uh, space for the people who really wanted to know about the uh, Nepal and uh, women, especially women. Just last week, I received a call from German Germany uh, from the Osnaborg University when I shared this movie link of this movie in my um, uh, uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook. They wanted to have to have a discussion with me uh, as like today and most probably they will plan next week. So oh. it, it creates the space. Mm -hmm. uh, um, because of the internet access uh, and because it is not easily available in the uh, uh, Google for a long time, that is why many people don't know. But uh, the, those people who are in the uh, movie, like uh, Bistu Neopane, who was working as a assistant uh, chief district officer that time, he and I sent the link to him. I also sent the link to other other colleagues like Kalika, where we. Uh, live as a homestay and uh, other friends uh, they, they, they have already watched and they moved on so this movie is really uh, um, uh, very inspiring uh, but uh, because of the language and internet is still yeah. not much as i expected all right all right interesting okay. but it's one thing I wanted to share, that movie we saw in uh, 2016 in Bhaktapur. That time the friends from uh, German embassy were participated and then they were impressed the way uh, I worked and then they wanted to support. So uh, when we started the sanitary pad factory, uh, biodegradable sanitary pad factory in Chitawan, um, uh, that time, ten thousand um, dollar we we got from German embassy, which is really a good support for us to to uh, kick up the factory. So it has a um, impact, but uh, still um, there is a more space to 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 make real impact. Yeah, and I, I, I hope it will it will impact more when it is easily available in, in, in uh, Google. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Good. Thank you, Rada. <laughs> <laughs> Should I also add some more? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Now, basically, there is a big impact uh, from this movie. It's the different perspective to see Nepal itself. And uh, it's, we cannot just uh, measure the impact of the movie by just seeing our surrounding or uh, small area of uh, uh, demography. It's better we just see the mental changes of the people that how people start to think about several things which is mentioned in the uh, movie itself. Mm -hmm. And I really love the movie, the way it is presented, the way it is filmed and designed. It's really a great work from Simon and Anji that they really saw the different perspective of Nepal, which I think in most of the documentaries about Nepal, it is not really uh, mentioned the inner side of Nepal how it actually looks and what is the, uh, what each individual is thinking and how they are perceived. It's really, uh, really artistic way is given in this uh, documentary. 
and mm. uh, we have done several premieres in in our premises and people who ever saw this movie they are really impressed by the uh, by the understanding of each individual what they feel about the country and what they feel about their existence that's the greatest part of the, this movie it's nice yeah it's very that's that's what i wondered as well especially you're you're nepali and when you see the movie if you feel represented in a way you know because that's ultimately what we try of course as well to not only make a movie for western people to show and then like they see it oh, okay that's happening there or that might be happening there but also that the feeling of nepalis get transmitted into this film and and they feel like okay this this is actually accurate i'm probably there's not 100% accurate in all of this of course because there's also an artistic side to it but um it's nice to hear from you that uh, you feel there is a certain amount of depth probably in there which shows uh, nepal's other sides which may other documentaries have left out so this, this is really interesting to me hmm. maybe as well it said that it was one of our biggest goal to to show um, nepal um like the people of Nepal, the real people, we always said, I remember we always said the sentence, we want to show the real people of Nepal, not only the Sherpas, which is um, shown in like all the movies that I like that I've seen from Nepal mostly are about the Himalayas and the Sherpas. So um, maybe what we tried to show was also all some kind of other, other um, faces there, facets. And there, maybe you could do thousands of movies like, like this from only Nepal, but five were definitely enough at that time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I still have a question about the Sherpa that came in mind of me, uh, in my mind during watching. Um, how is how was the status of the Sherpa before this? Um, uh, mountain tourism started was it also as high as today or was it different did you understand um, the question? not really <laughs> how was the status of the sherpa before the tourism you mean uh, the the status like the social status um because they are ethnic group if they were like more in the border of the societies society because today in the in the tourist industry they they have quite a honorable position yeah yeah and how was it maybe it's the best to answer this because you are <laughs> you are a man you know it so so well there in nepal no definitely the ethnic group serpas most of them they live in the high altitude uh, in Nepal, mountain region starts from 3,500 meters above. Uh, and uh, the Sherpa community, most of them, they used to do, some of them used to do the trade, the salt trading from uh, Tibet to Nepal. And basically they, they do the animal husbandry, yak, uh, goats and the mountain reason is known as the reason for the Sherpa. So after the before the tourism appeared in Nepal, they were obviously in some kind of famine. And uh, many of the Sherpas who came across the, the idea of uh, following tourists is uh, their day-to-day -day habit that they are born there, they, they, are, they know well about, about these mountains. And it was quite common that rather than somebody else go to carry the bags that Serpa would go along the side with the tourists. Yeah, and do you want to add something? 
No, I think you caught the central point that they were like maybe, like most Nepalis, they were self sufficient in their farming. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, what I maybe what I can add from our Sherpa, um, what I remember, what what like what we really learned was like before the tourism, they were um, like really proud men loving the mountains. Like it was more more like a spirit itself, and um, it was not like a hero in the mountain. But maybe we, especially Western or American people, made the Sherpas really. Uh, famous because for sure they they, they carry um in, yeah extremely oh, yeah. of baggage and luggage on their yeah. on their shoulders just to bring us up there and it I think it changed the status from it's just the way they live and now to a more heuristic status. yeah definitely change the demographic in in the long term because it's it's I, I mean it was hard for us in general i think when we were there as well um of course we had to film this project for example we had help from the sherpas as well and without them we couldn't have done it because i can hardly uh, have 15 kilos on my back and and otherwise i would have died there and um, so it was, was a massive help um, but at the same time, you feel very weird about the fact that you're filming this this uh, this project about the sheriffs, and then you receive help from them in the same way, which you yeah, the, it was a weird conflict with us especially. Um, to so yeah. I don't know what we I think what we tried is to just see the human in in everyone who surrounded us and and. Um, I don't know, we made great friends during the trip and it didn't feel like they were our sharepers or anything. It was just people with us doing the journey. And of course, they, at the end of the day, yeah, they get, get paid for that. And it was a weird feeling. And it, I don't know, for, for, for the Western people who come there, they should, be, they should be open to the fact that they are paying someone to do the work there and, and to and that this changed the whole demographic of, uh, of, the, of the Sherpas. And that is sort of an important fact. And I mean, we try to, to picture that in the, in the documentary, um, but we were faced with the same problem, I guess. That's what I wanted to say, yeah. But I also, um, the, the command um, of, uh, what is his name, Penchen? Uh, uh, that he was also um, ha treated like a member of a family by this one tourist that uh, took him when he was 12 years old. Um, it's also a nice connection to this relation, I think. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, what I have learned about this, well, I mean, this is a bigger context. There was like a country before which had very low inf infrastructure, I have to say, no? Like Nepal in the 1950s was still totally locked down, no? And 99% of the people, they simply lived as, uh, they had their own field and they grew what they could grow and that was it, no? And in a way, I think we know it from documentaries from, from uh, India, for example, where Helen Norberg Hodge was very clearly documenting how first people were actually up to a certain degree, maybe they had a hard life, but then they were also satisfied. And then with the entry of the tourists, they only started to recognize what they were missing. No? So um, this is like this balance. And then there is also Sherpa is an ethnic group. So they define themselves by certain rituals, by similar culture and so on. It is our concept of Sherpa, which is like a, a equivalent, equivalent to someone who's carrying our luggage. No? This has been this concept has been made by the tourists. And I mean, mainly because they have been living for generations on this high altitude, they simply are able to do so. And I mean, as he says in the movie, he loves to show around this place, no? So on the other hand, you have to say, even if tourists wouldn't come, like Westernization has reached Nepal, as every, it has every spot on this planet, no? So nowadays there is a demand for, for TVs, for mobile phones and so on. And, and therefore their life would have changed no matter if there would be tourists. Like we saw it in Joomla versus, versus the trekking areas. You see how life is changing, no? 
And simply where there are tourists, at least there comes infrastructure like buses or telephone lines or internet. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Maybe let's say in, in Nepal, it's, it's like the, the progress from the, 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 techno the um, development of technology it went like extremely fast, right? And this changed so many, so many different groups as well. Like maybe, maybe too fast as well. In some kind, like the tourists are just like streaming into this country, and it's yeah, it's overwhelming to see what's happening. Like people are trying to 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 keep the balance, but it's, mm. yeah, interesting to see. But I have to say, I've never seen from like my perspective. Um, I think the Nepalese people, they are like, I would say real fighters as well. Like in, there was the earthquake, there were so many like wars as well, but it's, it's all going back. Like they really strong people, really strong people in every case. True. I remember when I was going, going up the mountain and, uh, an old lady, really, really old lady came by me and she passed me and <laughs> my my western ego said like yeah i have to beat this woman in climbing up the mountain <laughs> so i rushed forward and after time i was just i was just completely sweated and i couldn't move anymore i i, I was literally crying and i was sitting on a stone and sent, then she calmly passed by and she was just smiling like ah the young one <laughs> so she, she there was no way to just outrun her or, she was so patient and, and strong. And that's the impression we got from so many Nepali people in every direction, in Joomla and on the mountain, everywhere they were really strong-minded people. And, and that's, that was fantastic to watch in general. Yeah. Does anybody else have questions for the more? Not yet. I see we are now at the earthquake chapter, right? Oh, Salvos with without the beard. You look so different. Yeah, I look totally different now. I have to say, maybe I can add here just a little bit. For me personally, I remember this chapter was the most exhausting. Um, although we didn't hike any mountains or wearing any jungle or traveling around, but it was the last chap chapter we did and it was really emotional, extremely emotional. And a lot of, I think a lot of background stories to digest as well. So it was not about only the the earthquake itself, but the political situation in Nepal and this was really shocking in one kind what's happening but greatly yeah Sarah, you i think you were the, the the best protagonist for this one to to get really deep into this story yeah i remember i was my employee when you told me or told us all the 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 interwoven parts of this one it was strange now that i was also at the beginning i was not the part of this thing and <laughs> return you insist yeah right of course you i remember <laughs> no i came at the end you know no it, <laughs> it's uh no the whole situation the earthquake and the governmental role and public individuals role everything was acute now it was the situation itself was not really in favor of anybody like india was blocking the border we did not have enough yeah. uh, petroleum uh, and our medicine supplies coming to the country so more or less there was it was a tough time chaotic yeah okay. and you have experienced some of the uh, chaotic moments now <laughs> yes. 
because we we were trying to, I think back in in 2015 when we did the documentary like one liter of gas or like petrol was about five dollars right it was like every everything was blocked from the, from the Indian border there was no medicine coming in there was even kind of war breaking out in the southern part it was really a it was really harsh situation and it I think it was fascinating that people still um, they kept their routines you know like not panicking or something although like I, I think I remember thinking if this would happen in in Austria it would be just a lot it would be a lockdown like chaos total chaos but not in Nepal like it, it seems like yeah like what we see now in the in the movie itself like people were lining for hours to get some petrol and the situation was really bad yeah mm. okay. Thank you and we were driving yeah. Yeah. So we just have to always switch before i speak something otherwise we have to <laughs> echo. Uh, echo, yeah. Yeah. well i i also have perceived the nepalese as being extremely resilient and i think one reason for that is um, is that they have such a strong community, you know? So they are like so much just, just sticking together with each other and helping each other and just doing things on themselves. So even though they talk about a lot about, oh, the government should do this or the government should that, do that, but if the government doesn't do it, they simply do it themselves, no? And, and this is like, I also can observe now how they deal with, with COVID-19 in a very different manner than, than we do over here, no? So, uh, there is way less infected people over there. Still, the government is way more strict on all the <laughs> releasing. And then uh, even people who are <laughs> in our movie are now helping people who are like, the somehow some people have lost their, their apartments in the city and now they have to walk all the way back home. And there is like, the community is just gathering uh, 10, 10 euro here, 10 euro there, 10 euro here. And then they would just start to cook food for the people who are walking and... Um, and organize illegal buses at night and stuff. I've heard things like that happening, you know? So, um, so there's just like a gathering happening to say, okay, we help ourselves if government doesn't help us, no? Which I find, which makes them so strong, no? Yeah, and at the moment, hearing it, just cooking food for the people who are walking in the street. Yeah. And the there are several people who are at the moment it's total lockdown and people are not able to buy food in the in the city so they want to go back to their village and they are walking now and several people are just gathering together and they are helping out cooking food for the people who are whoever are passing by in the street and one of them is sharing yeah. is like the connection between us and and, and and one of them is cheering at the moment he's cooking every day from six o'clock and distributing food every day a really good cook yeah. <laughs> and a really big heart yeah in the with the heart it's true yeah yeah it would be fantastic uh, to have him here he he yeah, he's such a big part of, of all of this as well. And uh, I, I guess he just continued what he did with us. He's just helping everyone and, uh, and yeah, like a modern hero <laughs> roaming around in Nepal and doing his stuff. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a question for, for Sarish and Inge and Rada as well. Um, I wonder how the political situation did it change from the day like from the this year 2015 when we were filming oh did politics it, yeah <laughs> but I just you're really there to ask Sarah and Rada about politics okay <laughs> <laughs> no, I just One minute want to know. <laughs> do we have the time <laughs> no I just want to know if the like when we were there I think Sarah told me once that the younger generation is getting more um, forceful to change something. So I'm just wondering if it's still. No, if definitely the in political level, the upper ruling class level, nothing has changed yet. Uh, mm. Still, there is some kind of stability, but still, it's not stable. <laughs> 
and uh, I would rather say like slowly many of the youths are understanding the situation and they really think about the country positively and after this COVID also there will be a big situation that many of the people who are working in the Gulf countries maybe half of them would uh, come back to Nepal and mm -hmm. we know well that government will not do anything but every individual have to do on their own so the people are most of the people in Nepal to live their life they are not dependent upon government and to change the whole country I think in, each individual will do something from their perspective like we are doing and Radha is doing from her perspective so these small groups will want it together they will gather together and we'll have a better ideological better uh, uh, status in the politics too Mm -hmm. The political situation would get better. Yeah. I think Radha would add a lot of things about politics. Yeah. She's, She's now waiting. going from, from no, ministry to ministry. No, no, I, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not that much uh, political uh, person, though. I have been doing all political things without any political party, but I'm not much expert. Yeah. Even though I have a little bit different opinion. Uh, when we were shooting um, this uh, movie, that time uh, we had not had the constitution. After the earthquake, uh, we had a we, we finalized our constitution. That means we have a new constitution, right? And according to the constitution, right, there are so many uh, policies or uh, rights guaranteed. Um, for the girls, women, marginalized people, in terms of the uh, written statement in constitution. Our con constitution is one of the best constitution uh, in South Asia, regards to uh, pro-human right and uh, gender responsiveness. According to that constitution, uh, for you people, the, the outsiders, our country also female head, um, uh, female speaker, female chief justice few months uh, before. So there are some things changed in terms of the structure. And we also had a election in uh, and the country moves on the federal uh, democratic country. Uh, and in the local level government, uh, more than 40% women are in uh, position in, in the local government, I mean. But the other side of the constitution, the other side of the politics, is it's really not uh, um, impressive. In terms of the um, impunity, we have a culture of impunity, uh, high corruption, and um, we are still under um, still under the post conflict scenario. Um, uh, for others, our our government is uh, led by the majority of the uh, um, contested. I mean, the political uh, political majority of the uh, um, uh, leaders uh, leading the government. But inside, we are suffocating every day. Just last week, um, there was a audi new audience without consultants of the political parties and opposition, and it, it, it was like a disaster. And we did not know what uh, will decide by the uh, um, uh, leaders. Uh, the meeting is going on right now and if you see the mind state we are not much suffered from the COVID-19 but we are so much frustrated so much depressed and so much in suffocation because of the political uh, scenario and uh, if you see the from the perspective of the girls and women uh, it, it is more suffocating more suffocating because the, the enforcement of the policies are almost zero uh, if uh, I would face rape case right now, I have to think 200 times whether I should report or not. Um, even today, before the COVID, six women are raped in a day. And, and it is very difficult to get the justice. Um, and because of the COVID, 
the rape and other forms of gender based violence is shooting up and and there are some attempts uh, are uh, being in place from the government and the few ngos and um, we also uh, involved in the uh, global, uh, national level policy making as a, as a, as a um, uh, think tank and providing the input mobilizing the volunteers but it is a uh, tip of the iceberg many girls and women are still suffering and a long way to go little bit a little bit um, uh, pessimistic i mean the not not good news but this is the reality so sorry to share uh, the, the the real ground <laughs> But, well, um, I mean, I guess Saraj and Rada have said a lot and I, I guess they have, I mean, they're living there. I'm not like there since 2017 anymore. Still, I have the feeling that, uh, well, it's a slow change, of course. No, I think what Saraj sees her, there is a progress and what Rada is still struggling because she's like in the middle of mobilizing people and, and sees the problem. Um, I think both realities are, are simply existing parallel at one time, no? <clears throat> It, it takes time to really adopt into a democratic state, I guess. And Nepal was interrupted really fast with, uh, uh, there was the king and all of a sudden the king was assassinated and all of a sudden they were in this democracy and they didn't really know how to handle this. So I think this is a thing which simply takes generations times. So we talk here about that case. So I see like a small progress also happening. Like um, I would also see the optimistic side, but I also see the, the critical point, which Rada points out simply that things taking very long and especially the query critical aspect of corruption seems to like not really <laughs> have changed. And I think this is one central aspect. But then talking to the young people, I see a small shift in, in how they perceive things and so on. So um, slowly more people who are willing to come back and do something more. To, I, I keep to I, I keep to t use uh, the the words of Dalai Lama. Stay optimistic; it feels better. So I try to follow that. <laughs> How's the situation on? The and maybe just uh, because before there was the question if we had the feeling that the film changed something in Nepal. Just to add a small on topping on this question from Simon before, I think it changes something in everyone who sees it in Nepal because Nepalese don't have this habit of really traveling their country or reading about what is happening in different places in their country. They are a very diverse country and uh, like we talked before, before already about this ethnic group of the Sherpa and there are like 130 different ethnic groups with very different backgrounds and they, like we Europeans often have more interest in all their cultures than they have in each other's culture, you know, like they're just coexisting yeah. on a very peaceful level, which is very beautiful. But then this movie makes them a bit like, aha, like people from Kathmandu Valley might not be aware so much about how is the practice of Chaupadi done in, in rural Nepal. And on the other hand, maybe the Sherpas might have not known so much on how is the life of a Chakri in the South. No? So maybe for them also, it's a bit the kind of cultural <laughs> learning of your own culture to have a broader perception of what Nepal is looking like without that they have to travel the whole country. So I think, yes, it, it definitely helps, I think, in, in broadening their own self-understanding. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really nice. I, I had a question uh, before on the, on the thing you said where you think there's a slow change. And of course, I, I think, um, do you hear me? Does sorry. anyone hear me? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, that there changes change is always coming very slow in, in, in when it when it comes to yeah nationalities or like countries changing I guess. But do you also have the feeling because in Kathmandu for example, I think the change is going more like it, it's just just going faster because there's it's concentrated. There's a lot of people. There's coming technology in it. But when you go to the rural places where we've been in Jumla, for example, do you think there is also a, a change in perspective from the people where they see, okay, this is we we want to adapt to the to the to the city life probably, or we just want to keep this traditional? It has anything in the last years? How's the perception there? I think Rada has to take this now. Because I have not been in the rural area, neither has the rural. So maybe. Did you understand the question, Rada? 
<laughs> I think she, she needs Simon. You should um, type. I should, I should type. Yeah. All right. All right. The microphone is not. So, Saroji, you respond if you like, and I will respond to this. Did right. culture in the rural area change? Are people becoming more urban? Uh, yes. Yes. In terms of the um, <laughs> change in the um, rural settings, um, the communication is, um, I mean, the network, the telephone, is uh, getting popular. The government is um, trying to reach out to the most remote areas. And though the network is not uh, good everywhere, but um, one third of the population, including rural areas, they started to use the Facebook and smart mobile. They start to watch the movie nowadays. And Education, health, kind of public services are more or less same. There is no change. In terms of the intellectuality, we, we, we still under uh, transition. But um, clothing pattern, uh, eating, like everyone start to eat um, the fast food, noodles, the different kinds of juice, that kind of things. Uh, you can see even in the rural areas, uh, um, like um, in in uh, Mugurara, which is the adjoining uh, district uh, of um, Jumla. When I was there first time in 2002, that time it was so organic, and when I was there in 2017, it was so chaotic already. You, I can see plastic bottles. Um, uh, everywhere in, in a forest, even in the lake. So without having the foundation, without having the knowledge about the negative consequences, uh, because of the technology, especially in the telecommunication and some sort of globalization, they are aware about the um, uh, lifestyle from uh, Western world and they just copied and um, there are so many negative consequences, rather uh, positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Thank you very much. Comment. Um. We are already have um have passed fifteen minutes over the time and the film is also already <laughs> over so slowly we have to close the meeting uh, but yeah if somebody has still a burning question please ask it <laughs> if something is not has has not been uh, asked yet shall i respond for this or in the last one ramin <laughs> asking for questions <laughs> huh? <laughs> Can you type it? No, so I think if there's no questions, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> thank you very, very much for, for participating. And so nice that uh, all of you had the time to join, especially <laughs> Angie, Simon, and Rada, and Sasha. <laughs> um, yeah. It was very lovely. Thank you. Yeah, no. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe thank I you. <laughs> no, it was it was really nice just seeing everybody and talking about this home. But it was. Thank you. Uh, and maybe one one last question: Do you have still a, a project in Nepal, a film project or something um, in mind, or not at all, uh, Auntie and Simon? <laughs> um, not, but I know um, Simon did a second project, Sorry. right? <laughs> yeah, I I went uh, in two thousand seventeen. I went back to uh, Nepal and we did a 
actually in the same area where we've been before, um, right before. Uh, Lucky oh, you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I like, think you were in around Annapurna. Yeah, in the, in the Annapurna the circuit um, before. Um, um, okay, I don't remember the name at the moment, sorry. Um, but it was basically about free dentists, free Munich, uh, German dentists uh, out of Munich who went there and um, yeah, we went to a, to a public school where um, I think 40 Tibetan uh, childs were and they, they, yeah, it was the whole, whole journey from, from Kathmandu to that um, school and then they helped out everyone and uh, tried to um, because they had a clinical station there and they renewed some, some um, supplies and helped, helped the kids with the, with the teeth. A lot of the kids had really rotten teeth, so it was time for help, I guess. Um, yeah, so I did, did a second movie. It's called, called Annapurna Flossing for everyone who's interested. Um, but for the future, for now, there's nothing else planned in Nepal. But I never say never because... I'm, I'm, I'm coming to Nepal way, way more than I would ever think of. So <laughs> probably I'm going to land there again and then we see. I don't know. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Yeah, so we have something else. Uh, so if somebody's interested, <laughs> you can watch this also. <laughs> yeah, so I was. I was a while ago thinking about making Homebird too. I have to say like a few weeks ago, it went to my mind saying, okay, <laughs> how could we portray another five people to make the picture even broader? Because even these five people are like not really still representing, no? Like yeah. I was talking about the neighbor women and their daily culture, which is very different, for example, from a Jumla woman. No? So there will be so many more stories to tell. So let, maybe maybe one day we do the project. <laughs> Homebird. Five are coming. <laughs> now really interesting because everyone got his own experience as well and <laughs> we know how the team works now <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> good, good car and <laughs> good car and the making of person because this would be very bad <laughs> very good <laughs> there needs to be a second camera on us all the time <laughs> so yes that's <laughs> what the future will bring <laughs> yeah so um yeah we'll close now the meeting soon um yeah we have recorded it i think it was a bit difficult with the video and uh, um, the videos of each person but i hope we, yeah, we will manage to to put it on youtube so maybe more people will also see it and yeah i do have one last question though. ah okay <laughs> yeah one last question I was just thinking, like, uh, is there anywhere some information about what kind of equipment you use? For the movie? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Angie? Yeah, actually the whole movie was uh, um, the final project for my final exams. Like, the small, like the, the trailer was for the final project, so I'd say like this. But I did a whole um, writing down, it's like a book where you can read everything like how the whole movie is produced what we used even the financial part if this is interesting for someone um it's like a, a it's like maybe a workbook for really small documentary filmmakers where can you where can i find this um if you want you can um write me an email and i can send it to you so you have it for pdf are you planning are you planning to do a documentary? Um, yeah, since 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I would love to. something like 80% planning, 20% implementation also. <laughs> <laughs> and can we give any advice? Yeah, yeah maybe you can, write, uh, you can write your email address also in chat. Sure, yeah. I you have, have been questions. sharing like Angie's website because I found it. I didn't find Simon's website. I've been sharing Rada's website. I've been sharing Jess's website. Just Simon, I didn't find yours. So yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah, in the so chat, everyone can contact us as well, and we we can give like private private answers as well. Because yeah, maybe, maybe the only thing I can say. Oh hi, <laughs> is. I think for documentary filmmaking, you just have to 
do you just have to start at one point otherwise it's just never gonna happen with it's maybe the same with every big project but you just do it <laughs> and then yeah. you go your way i actually find getting frustrating <laughs> <laughs> when you said that you you just after school just went there without a plan and stuff because i always thought that um at the film school that they tell you the whole time that you have to plan it have to have it planned out yeah <laughs> It's exactly what was happening. Yeah, so we learned a lot of um, um, like storyboarding, and you need to do a lot of concept, and that's also my nature. Like I'm a really organized, organizing freak, and we did some some like planning, let's say, but not not like a story. We didn't know the, the face to the person. We knew, okay, I mean, what we knew was. We want to go there. We want to do a documentary about the people and maybe we put it in chapters. So that was kind of the big thing we wanted to do, but there was definitely no concept writing down or um, like planning which day we go to what um, area or something because it was simply not possible. And even then, if we would have done all the planning, it would just never ever worked out in this way because you can't plan like this. So I think for documentary filmmaking, what I learned most from Simon was you have to go with the flow because <laughs> there were, were good stuff is happening. Seriously, yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah. So at the end you did enjoy leaving your organized... Um... Yeah, I had to. <laughs> Maybe this was because like this was why Simon and we, me, we were a good fit because he's the real creative eye and he doesn't care about anything, what I was saying when I <laughs> did some planning. <laughs> but um, yeah, so there were like these two components, they were, they were working out, but on the way, also while we were filming, while we were there, we, I think we developed our, our skills like yeah. we didn't know we had two cameras we had like and on the way we figured out okay simon definitely has to do most of the filming and i do the planning because that's just our our skills so we we learned by doing who is better in which in which area i mean if i i think one one tip in general and what to, to... And, yeah to say more to what you just said, Angie, is uh, I think one, if you, if you have the feeling, for example, that you do, you do, you do want to uh, go for a documentary or any kind of project in this direction, but you feel like, okay, maybe that's not the money, there's not, I'm do, you're doing this all yourself, you know, and it's like this big project over your head. And then that feels very scary to, to just do it. I think what helped us or me at least in, insanely was that we were just, we were two, you know, I could ask her for advice and she could ask me for advice. And that was just so much easier to start into this because you had another opinion and you, you didn't feel like you have to, to, to do this film alone. And even one person, which is very, we were, you, you gotta meet someone who's inspired as you are, you know, and then because alone, that's very hard. And, just go open-mindedly to other people and say like, hey, I have this kind of idea in my head and uh, I want to realize it. It's, it's just to start it. It's basically, it's the easiest tip at, at any time for e anything basically start it. Um, because otherwise it, 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 you say you want to do this for 20 years and maybe then it doesn't stay a dream. It, it can become reality and it, you don't have to have all this financial um, tools with you of course it helps but i mean we were struggling as well and we we, we kind of did it and yeah just get someone who's excited as you are and there will be results no worries yeah what it <laughs> sure. sure and read angie's script <laughs> if it's a starter guide <laughs> Whatever she says. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so.
thank you once more, everybody, also for thank participating. You. And yeah, thank you for organizing. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, too. <laughs> Have a wonderful day, guys. Yeah. <laughs> also <laughs> to everybody and good Thank luck, you. Dada, with everything. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Maybe we can just put it like offline. Yeah, I was wondering like the yeah. information. Stop the recording, maybe. Yeah, I stopped the recording. Yeah. I'm staying. <laughs> <laughs> freeze! Everyone freeze! <laughs>